this is actually a topic that I used to put poor, innocent new recruits through, particularly if they came from a non-marketing background. Even though this is considered by a lot of people to be an advanced topic, I think it's something that actually it makes sense for people who want to learn about SEO to learn first, because it's foundational. And if you if you think about a lot of other technical SEO and link building topics from this perspective, they make a lot more sense and are simpler and you kind of figure out the answers yourself rather than needing to read 10,000 word blog posts and patents and this kind of thing. Anyway, hold that thought. Because it's 1998, I am six years old and this is a, a glorious state of the art video game and internet browsing that I do in my computer club at school looks a bit like this. Uh, I actually didn't use Yahoo, I used Excite, which in hindsight was a mistake, but in my defense, I was six. The one thing you'll notice about this as a, as a starting point for a journey on the internet compared to something like Google or whatever you use today, maybe even like something that's built into your browser these days. And um, there's a lot of links on this page. And mostly there are links to pages with links on them on this page. It's, it's kind of like a, um, like a taxonomy directory system. Uh, and this, this is important because if a lot of people browse the web using links and links are primarily a navigational thing, then we can, we can get some insights out of, out of looking at links. They're a sort of proxy for popularity. You know, if, if we assume that everyone starts, um, the, starts their journey on the internet on Yahoo, in 1998, then the pages that are linked to from Yahoo are gonna get a lot of traffic, right? They are by definition popular and the pages that those pages link to will also still get quite a lot and so on and so forth. And through this, we could build up some kind of picture of what websites are popular. And popularity is important because if you show popular websites to users in search results, then they will be more trustworthy and, you know, credible and likely to be good and this kind of thing. This is massive oversimplification, bear with me, but this is kind of why Google won. Google recognized this fact and they, they came up with an innovation called PageRank, which made their search engine better than other people's search engines and which every other search engine subsequently went on to imitate. However, is anything I said just now relevant 23 years later? We, we definitely do not primarily navigate the web with links anymore. We use these things called search engines, which Google might know something about. Um, but also we use news feeds, which are kind of dynamic and uncrawlable uh, and all sorts of other non-static HTML link based patterns. Links are probably not the majority even of how we navigate our way around the web, except maybe within websites. And Google has better data on popularity anyway, right? Like Google, runs a mobile operating system, they run ISPs, they run a browser, they run YouTube. There's lots of ways for Google to figure out what is and isn't popular without building some arcane link graph. However, be that true or not, this still is, still is a core methodology to, und to underpins how Google works on a foundational level. In 1998, it was the case that PageRank was all of how Google worked, really. It was just PageRank plus relevance. These days, there's a lot of nuance and layers on top. And even PageRank itself, you know, probably isn't even called that and probably has changed and been refined and tweaked around the edges. And it might, it might be that PageRank is not used as a proxy for popularity anymore, but maybe as a proxy for trust or something like that. And it has a slightly different role in the... Uh, in the algorithm. But the point is we, we still know purely through um, empirical evidence that changing how many and what pages linked to a page has a big impact on organic performance. So we still know that something like this is happening. Um, and the way that Google talks about how links work in their algorithm still reflects a broadly page rank based understanding as do developments in uh, SEO directives and href lang and rel amp and this kind of thing it still all speaks to a page rank based ecosystem if not a page rank only ecosystem uh, also i'm calling it page rank because that's what google calls it but some other things you should be 
aware of that SEOs use. Uh, link equity, I think, is, is a good one to use because it kind of explains what you're talking about in a useful way. Link flow, it's not bad, and but link flow is alluding to a different metaphor that you've probably seen before where you think of links as being sent through big pipes of liquid that then pour in different amounts into different pages. It's a different metaphor to the popularity one. And it, as a result, it has some different impl implications if it's overstretched. So uh, use some caution. And then linking strength. I, I don't really know what metaphor this is trying to do. Um, it doesn't seem as bad as link juice, at least fine, I guess. More importantly, how does it work? Um, I don't know if any, anyone here hates maths. If you do, I'm sorry, but there's going to be maths. So the, the initial sort of question is, or the, the foundation of all this is, now imagine that, so A, in the red box here, that's a web page, to be clear, in this diagram. Imagine that the whole internet is represented in this diagram. There, there's only one web page, which means this is 1970-something, I guess. What is the probability that a random browser is on this page? We can probably say it's it's one or something like that. We, if, if you want to have some other take on that, it kind of doesn't matter because it's all just going to be based on whatever number that is. From that, though, we can sort of try to infer some other things. So whatever probability you thought that was, and let's say we thought that if there's one page on the internet, everyone's on it. What's probability that a random browser is on the one page A links to? So say that we've pictured the whole internet here. A is a page that links to another page, which links nowhere. Um, and we started by saying that everyone was on this page. Well, what's probability now after, after a cycle that everyone will be on this page? Well, we go with the assumption that there's an 85% chance and the 85% number comes from Google's original 1998 white paper. It's an 85% chance that they go onto this one page in their cycle and a 15% chance that they do one of these non-browser based activities. Um, and the reason, the reason why we assume that there's a, a chance on every cycle that people exit to do non-browser based activities is because otherwise we get some kind of infinite cycle later on. We don't need to worry about that, but um, yeah, the, the point is that if you assume that people never leave their computers and that they just browse through links endlessly, then you end up assuming eventually that every page has infinite traffic, which is not the case. That's, a, that's, the, that's the starting point where we have a, this really simple internet we have a page with a link on it and a page without a link on it, and that's it. Something to bear in mind with these systems is obviously web pages don't have a link on them and web pages with no links on them are virtually unheard of, like the one on the right. This gets really complex really fast. If we try to make a diagram just of two pages on the Moz website, it would not fit on this screen, right? So we're talking in really simplified versions here, but it doesn't matter because the principles are extensible. So what if, page, the page on the left, actually linked to two pages, not one. What is the probability now that we're on one of those two pages? We're taking that 85% chance that they move on at all without exiting because the house caught fire, they went for a bike ride or whatever. Um, and we're now, we're now dividing that by two. So we're saying 42.5% chance that they were on this page, 42.5% chance you're on this page, and then that you know nothing else happens because there's no more links in the world. That's fine. What about this page? So if this page now links to one more, how does this page of strength relate to page A? So this one was 0.85 over two, and this one is 0.85 times that number. So we note that we're diluting as we go along because we've applied that 15% deterioration on every step. This is useful and interesting to us because we can imagine a model in which page A on the left is a home page and the page on the right is some page we want to rank and we're diluting with every step that we have to jump to get there and this is crawl depth which is a metric that is exposed by Moz Pro and most other technical SEO tools that that's why crawl depth is something that people are interested in is this and um, part of it is discovery which we won't get into today but part of it is also this dilution factor. And then if, we, if this page actually linked to three, then again, the, each of these pages is only one third as strong as when it only linked to one. So there's the, it's being split up and diluted the further down we go. So that all got very complicated, very quick on a very simple 
fictional website. Don't panic. The lessons we want to take away from this are quite simple, even though the, the mass becomes very arcane very quickly. So the first lesson we want to take is that each additional link depth diluted value. So we talked about the reasons for that, but obviously it has implications for, for site structure. It also has implications for some other things, some other common technical SEO issues that I'll cover in a bit. So if, if I link to a page indirectly, that is less effective than linking to a page directly, even in a world where every page only has one link on it, which is obviously an ideal scenario. The other takeaway we can, we can have is that more links means each link is less valuable. So if every additional link you add to your homepage, you're reducing the effectiveness of the ones that the links that are already there. Uh, so this is, this is very important because if you look on a lot of sites right now, you'll find 600 link mega navs at the top of the page and the same at the bottom of the page and all this kind of thing. And that can be, a, uh, that can be an okay choice. The, I'm not saying that's always wrong, but it is a choice and it has dramatic implications. Some, some of the biggest changes in SEO performance I've ever seen on websites came from cutting back the number of links on the homepage by a factor of 10. If you, if you change a homepage so that it goes from linking to 600 pages to linking to the less than 100 that you actually want to rank, that will almost always have a massive difference, a massive impact, more so than external link building could ever dream of because you're not gonna get that 10 times difference through external link building, ex unless it's a startup or something. So yeah, some, some real world scenarios. I wanna talk about basically some things that SEO tools often flag that we're all familiar with talking about as, as SEO issues or optimizations or whatever, but often we don't think about why, and we definitely don't think of them as being things that hark back quite so, so deep into Google's history. So a, a redirect is a link. That the fictional idea of a page with one link on it is a redirect. Because a redirect is just a page that links to exactly one other page. So in this scenario, the page on the left could have linked directly to the page in the top right. But because it didn't, we've got this 0.85 squared here, which is 0.7225. The only thing you need to know about that is that it's a smaller number than 0.85. Because we didn't link directly, we went through this page here that redirected, which doesn't feel like a link, but is a link in this, in this uh, ecosystem. We've just arbitrarily decided to dilute the page at the end of the cycle. And this is obviously particularly, particularly important when we think about chain redirects, which is another thing that's often flagged by SEO tools. But when you look in an issue report in something like Moz Pro and it, set, and it gives you a list of redirects as if they're issues, that can be confusing because a redirect is something we're also told is a good thing, right? Like if we have a URL that's no longer in use, it should redirect. But what the reason that issue is being flagged is we shouldn't still be linking to the URL that redirects. We should be linking directly to the thing at the end of the chain. Um, and this is why. It's because this arbitrary dilution that we're we're inserting into our own website, which is basically just a dead weight loss. If you imagine that in reality, pages do tend to link back to each other, you know, this will be a big complex web and cycle that is, and I think this is where the flow thing comes around because pe people can imagine a flow of buckets that drip round into each other, but leak a little bit at every step and then you get less and less water um, unless there's some external source. If you imagine these are looping back round, then Inserting redirects is just, you know, a dead weight loss. We've drilled a hole in the bottom of a bucket. So yeah, better is direct link, worse is a 302, although that's a controversial subject. Who knows that Google sometimes claim that they th treat 302s as 301s these days. Let's not get into that. Canonicals, very similar. A canonical from a page rank perspective. A canonical is actually a much later addition to search engines, but the uh, a canonical is basically equivalent to a 301 redirect. So if we have this uh, badges page, uh, which has two versions, so you can access it by going to badges, question mark, color equals brown, or you can, uh, so I um, imagine I have a website that sells live badges for some reason in different colors. Um, then I might have these two different URL variants for my, my badger e-com page filtered to brown. 
And I've decided that this one without any parameters is the, is the canonical version, literally and figuratively speaking. If the home page links to it via this parameter page, which then has a canonical tag pointing at the correct version, then I've arbitrarily weakened the, the correct version versus what I could have done, which would be the direct link through. Interestingly, if we do have this direct link th through, note that this page now has no strength at all. There's, it's now, now has no inbound links. And also it probably wouldn't get flagged as an error in a tool because the tool wouldn't find it. Uh, that you'll notice I put a tilde before the number zero. We'll, we'll come to that. Page rank sculpting um, is another thing that I think it's interesting because people still try to do it, even though it's not worked for a really long time. Um, this is, so this, this is an imaginary scenario that is not imaginary at all. It's really common. Most probably has this exact scenario where your homepage links to some pages you care about and also some pages you don't really care about, certainly from an SEO perspective, such as your privacy policy. Kind of sucks because in this, extreme example here, having a privacy policy has just randomly halved the strength of a page you care about. No one wants that. Um, so what people used to do was they would use a, a link level no follow. They use a link level no follow, which, so the idea was, and it worked at the time, and by the, at the time, I mean like 2002 or something, um, but people still try this on new websites today. The idea was that by effectively the no, link level nofollow removed this link. So it was as if your homepage only linked to one page. Great, everyone's a winner. Side note I talked about before. So no page actually has zero page rank. A, a page with no links in the page rank model has the, has the page rank one over the number, the number of pages on the internet. That's the seeding probability that at the start of before everything starts going and the cycles round and figures out what the stable equilibrium page rank is, they assume that there's an equal chance you're on any page on the internet. One divided by the number of pages on the internet is a very small number. So we can think of it as zero. This was changed. Um, our, our little no follow hack was changed again, a very, very long time ago. Um, such that if you use a link level no follow, and by the way, this is also true if you use robots.txt to do this, this link, this second link will still be counted in when we when we go here and we have this divided by two to say we're we're halving, you know, there's an equal chance that you go to either of these pages. This page still gets that reduction because it was one of two links. But this page at the bottom now has no strength at all because it was only linked to through a no follow. So this is kind of a if you do this now, it's a worst of both worlds scenario. And you, you might say, oh, I don't actually care whether my privacy policy has zero strength, you know, whatever. But you do care because your privacy policy probably links through the top now to every other page on your website. So you're still doing yourself a, a disservice. Uh, second side note, I said link level no follow, meaning no follow in the HTML is an attribute of a link. There is also page level no follow, um, which I struggle to think of a single good use case for that's basically a page level no follow means we are going to treat every single link on this page as no follow. So we're just going to create a page rank dead end. This is a, a strange thing to do. So sometimes people use robots.txt, which basically does the same thing. Like if I block this page in robots.txt, that's the same in terms of the page rank consequences, except there are other good reasons to do that. Like I might not want Google to ever see this or I might want to prevent a massive waste of Google's crawlers time so that they spend more time crawling the rest of my site or something like this. There are reasons to use drops of text. Page level no follow is, you know, we're, we're gonna create that dead end, but also uh, we're gonna waste Google's time crawling it anyway. Uh, this, some of the extreme scenarios I just talked about, particularly the one with the privacy policy changed a lot in for the better for everyone in 2004 with something called Reasonable Surfer, which you occasionally still hear people talking about now, but mostly implicitly. Um, and it's probably actually an under discussed or under held in mind topic. 
So these days, and by these days, I mean for the last 17 years, if one of these links is was that massive call to action and another one of these links was in the footer, like a privacy policy link often is, then Google will apply some sense and say, well, you know, the chance of people click on this one is very, we were trying to figure out probabilities here, remember? So we'll, we'll just, we'll split this, this 0.9 and 0.1 still have to add up to one, but we'll split them in a more reasonable fashion. Yeah, they were doing that a long time ago. They've probably got very, very good at it by now. No index is an interesting one because traditionally you would think that has nothing to do with PageRank. Um, so yeah, if a no index tag just means this should never show up in search results. This page at the bottom, which is fine. There are some valid reasons to, to do that. Um, maybe you're worried that it will show up for the wrong query that something else on your site is trying to show up for, or maybe it contains sensitive information or something like this. Okay, fine. However, when you put a no index tag on something, Google eventually stops crawling it. And this only emerged, we, everyone sort of intuitively knew all the pieces of this puzzle, but it only emerged that uh, Google only acknowledged that this behavior is what happens a couple of years ago. So Google eventually stops crawling it. And when Google stops crawling on it, it, it stops passing page rank. So no index follow, which used to be a quite a good thing, or we thought quite a good thing to do for a page like an HTML sitemap page or something like that. Like an HTML sitemap page, clearly you don't want to show up in search results because it's kind of crap and a poor reflection on your site and not a good UX and this kind of thing. But it is a good way to pass equity through to a bunch of deep pages, right? Or so we thought. Uh, it turns out probably not. You know, it's, it was equivalent to that worst case scenario, no page level, no follow in the long run that we talked about earlier. And again, this is this is probably why no index is flagged as an error in tools like Moz Pro, although obviously often it's not well explained or, or understood. My pet theory on how links work uh, is that at this stage, they're no longer a popularity proxy because there's better ways of doing that, but they are a brand proxy. Um, you know, a frequently cited brand you know, a citation and link are often used synonymously in this industry, right? So that kind of makes sense. Uh, however, once you actually start ranking in the top five or 10, my experience is that links become less and less relevant the more and more competitive a position you're in because Google has increasingly better data to figure out whether people want to click on you or not. This is some data from 2009 um, contrasting ranking correlations in positions six to 10 versus positions one to five. Basically, both brand and link become less relevant um, in e or the easily measured versions become less relevant, um, which again is kind of uh, exploring that theory that the higher up you rank, the more bespoke and user signal based it might become. This is some older data where I basically looked at to what extent you can use domain authority to predict rankings, which is this blue bar, to what extent you could use branded search volume to predict rankings, which is this green bar, and to what extent you could use a model containing them both to predict rankings, which is no, not really any better than just using branded search volume. This is obviously simplified and flawed data, but this is um, some evidence towards the hypothesis that links are used as a brand proxy 